The following is a presentation of Rosenet TV, an internet TV channel for the borough of Madison, New Jersey. Uh, campus people and students to the special discussions. I think we have um, a real treat on our hands uh, t today. And I'm going to take a, just a minute to uh, explain why I think so. Occasionally in my cynical moments, I, I think that politics comes down to who can best oversimplify a complex problem and come up with a slogan uh, to sell that. And I sometimes think that our media pref uh, magnifies that by, uh, with their inclination to look for sound bites to catch a headline or uh, deal with a problem quickly and dismiss it and move on to the latest uh, murder or some other uh, uh, event uh, that seems to be more important to them. So, and, and then politics runs the whole spectrum from people on one side who who think that we've, we've got to use uh, politics to, to solve all of our serious problems on the one hand, the other end of the spectrum that feels like uh, politics can't do anything productive, it can only waste money and uh, provide opportunity for graft and, uh, and so on. So in the middle are people who try to implement these things and this includes politicians uh, it includes uh, people that work for state agencies, and it includes a lot of nonprofit types of organizations who usually have their own agenda and are usually well-meaning, uh, but they want their their agenda implemented. And so, to to have someone who really uh, has kind of worked this whole spectrum, he's been a, a uh, a politician, he's been a member of the state assembly, he's been a member of the state senate, he's uh, uh, experienced politics uh, from many perspectives, he's won elections, he's not won elections, uh, he's, um, he's run agencies and, and done uh, administrative type work, he was, been, he was on the staff of uh, Governor Hughes. He was on the staff of a White House task force on urban problems. Um, he was an assistant commissioner for education in New Jersey, or assistant to the commissioner for education in New Jersey, trying to deal with the Abbott issue. He's worked with nonprofits uh, from New Jersey Citizens for Better Schools. He's been the director of the Fund for New Jersey. So he's been in the middle of it. He's seen it from the upside, the downside, the right side, and the other side. Uh, he's currently a lecturer at the uh, Woodrow Wilson School at uh, Princeton and a fellow with the um, uh, Century Foundation, which uh, puts together some good uh, information on some complicated issues. The issue of, of school support in New Jersey is one of those complicated issues. On the one hand, we hear that it's been a catastrophe because the Supreme Court, we've heard in, in this forum that it's been a catastrophe because the Supreme Court's trying to run the school to, um, and we hear uh, on the other side of it that New Jersey has the best public schools around, and this is part of the reason. So sorting this all out takes some intelligence and some digging and some work, and his, uh, his work includes uh, a book uh, a dozen years ago or so on uh, wrong for all the right reasons, how white liberals have been undone by race, to a recent book uh, by the Century Foundation, In Plain Sight. A difficult lessons about New Jersey education. So, and if I may be permitted one more word. One of the things that I, 
I think that maybe has been learned from all this experience, and he's going to try to sort this all out and help us understand it. Um, one of the things that I think maybe has come out of this is the idea that if we get kids reading early and well, they do better in school, and if they do better in school, they do better in life. And being a librarian, that's a message near and dear to my heart. So uh, I'm looking forward to uh, what our speaker has to say. As an, uh, an MPA from the Woodrow Wilson School and went to a BA from Occidental College, I believe he's a resident here, right here in Marshtown. And so please give a warm welcome to Gordon McKins. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you, Jim, for that introduction. Um, you know, most speakers write their own introductions, because it's uh, people have to read it, right? Isn't that how it works? Uh, I'm pleased to be here. I brought some notes, uh, three pages. Each page represents about 25 minutes of unbroken delivery. So are you ready for that? Um, and I'll look to uh, Peter or Jim to tell me to stop, or, or this fellow right here. He's going to give me the symbol. Um, here we are gathered once again in uh, the United States to try and make sense out of a devilish problem, a terribly complicated problem uh, that we've not managed to solve uh, despite 40 years of effort. Uh, and to have this conversation in a fairly short time uh, with the hope that we can illuminate uh, the problem and maybe make some progress somehow in, in addressing it. Um, the uh, problem is that there is a gap between how well educated poor kids are and how well educated middle class kids are in the United States. That's a gap that we've known about for a long time. It's a gap that has really uh, uh, decided an awful lot of public policy over that time and it's a gap that has benefited or not from the expenditure of literally hundreds of billions of dollars by the federal government and by state governments and, and city school districts over many years, and yet that gap persists, and it persists uh, in an annoying way. Uh, it's narrowed somewhat. The nature of the problem has changed somewhat, but the gap persists. So I want to talk today about that gap, um, and I want to do it in three parts. First, I want to talk about why there is an achievement gap and why it is that it persists uh, despite the efforts of educators and politicians and justices and bureaucrats and teachers and parents and nonprofit organizations, et cetera. Uh, secondly, I want to talk about, and very briefly, about Abbott versus Burke, uh, which has been New Jersey's response to the achievement gap and describe what our Supreme Court has uh, decided and ordered over the years uh, and to put that in context. And then the third part of this is I will describe very briefly efforts that were made over a more than five year period by the Department of Education to take a different approach to the achievement gap, uh, which, re which resulted in some, in some places dramatic improvements in how well young kids performed um, and why that was so. And I want to draw some lessons from that experience. And I'm going to be, I'm going to draw eight lessons. And I've done all of this within the time parameters that I was given, and I'm going to try and uh, honor those. Um, but let's get started. 